Welcome back to Cut and Splice. This is Jason. And Matt. And this is Gil. And uh, tonight we are talking about Star Wars. Finally. Um, <laughs> we're not actually doing a normal episode on Star Wars, but um, I think uh, if uh, our two to five dedicated listeners, uh, just kidding, um, we're, um, you know, <clears throat> paying attention, then you would notice that, uh, on, it's a pretty regular thing that as we're talking, we, um, in the past, we've come across situations where somebody will mention an issue and then somebody else will say, well, that's like in star Wars or something like that. And it generally goes to the point where we, I interject and say something to the effect of, I don't really have time to go into my feelings on that subject because it would take us all night. Does that sound about right to you guys? Uh, yeah. And, and here we are. (laughs) Yeah. So, um, I don't remember if it was Gil or Matt or some, I don't remember who said it first, but, uh, the idea came up to just go ahead and actually make good on our, (laughs) on our, uh, um, comments and just sort of actually talk about star Wars at some point. <laughs> and, and I'm going to make a bold prediction that this might end up being our longest, uh, episode yet. <laughs> <laughs> Possibly, I guess I, I don't, um, I don't need to go into all of it right now or anything, but, um, I was sort of mentioning before we started recording, I have just about four to five important points that I wanted to get across, Um, when regarding these things, it's just kind of the stuff that I feel like, um, answers or my take on the things that we tend to bring up when we're talking about star Wars and when, when it gets brought up in our other movie conversations and stuff like that. And just, um, you know, uh, things like that. But, um, yeah, that's what I was thinking. Okay. Yeah. And we can probably go into it first. Um, maybe, uh, me and Matt can first give uh, our thoughts as far as like, and you as well, like essentially what Star Wars means to us um, on, on an overall um, yeah. kind of idea. And then we can get into the specifics, the uh, the good, the bad, the ugly, uh, all the um, the mess that is a uh, franchise. Um, that makes sense. Yeah. Um, Matt, do you have any thoughts on what I just said as far as uh, overall? Uh, holy Jesus, Jew. Um, okay. Uh yeah yeah that sounded personal yeah (laughs) i mean i i how can star wars not be personal for anybody who is over the age of 30 not star wars your 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 comment (laughs) or your your (laughs) expletive (laughs) yeah Yeah. jews for jesus I, i the the original three movies shaped my childhood in ways that only fiction can do it, you know it, it it is basically the short end of what picasso said about you know art is a lie that forces us to see the truth it, it's it's the imagination land episode of south park of you know this is more real than most of the real people that you have in your life. Uh, you learn so much from it, and you're on this journey with these characters, and they grow and blossom, and uh, and you learn from them, and you care about them, and it's transcendent. And then the prequels came out, and I think Phantom Menace came out when I was uh, 14, and I mean, my dad took me out of school so I could see it opening day, you know, at at noon or something. You know, like I, I and you know, even though looking back on it, it's not a very good movie. I was still enamored by it. I was taken by it. I was, uh, it, you know, the imagination and the, uh, you know, the the grandeur of it was just affecting and then uh, you know the the prequels were kind of up and down and they had their problems but there was still an imagination and a a childlike wonder to them and then jar jar abrams got involved and he ruined my childhood but uh huh 
Twice. Twice. Two franchises. Yeah, 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 both with Star Trek and Star Wars. But yeah, he, he's yeah, I, I I will always have a special place of animosity in my heart for J.J. Uh, uh, Abrams. Uh, and we can get into that later, but that's my brief overview. Yeah, and uh, and the reason why I brought up like to getting our initial impressions um, to not get too specific, but but I do believe there's something very mythical about Star Wars, especially the first movies, because um, much in the ways that maybe Jaws was the first blockbuster movie and, and all that, and and it's not exactly Star Wars. It's not timeless. It's not. Um, it's not generational. It's it, it's none of those things. It's just a very very good movie. But Star Wars basically feels like sometimes when I think about it, I almost feel like movies were made or created, invented because these stories need to be told in this specific way, and yeah. only in this specific way. Like basically, George Lucas. I don't know how he did it. A combination of like taking a little bit from Kurosawa, a little bit from Dune, a little bit from from Joseph Campbell, and he mixed it all in, and he's basically made the quintessential story, uh, uh, probably of yeah, all Flash time. Gordon. Flash Gordon, too. Yeah, uh, all that the the sci-fi serials and stuff, um, B movie type of like adventure movies. Yeah, there's a lot of mixed in there, but but the mix is so so well done that to me like it, it really the only thing i can relate it to is our ancestors somewhere in a cave telling epic stories about their ancestors that fought big you know bears or caught the buffalo or you know like told these epic stories about uh, about you know the stories that we were tell around the fire star wars reinvented that that fire that telling a story around the fire only it was a screen. It really felt like it was the first time that the movie, that the silver screen was almost perfectly utilized for what it was supposed to be, to completely captivate an audience and transport them and in a way that wasn't done before by any movie. All science fiction before then, apart from 2001 Space Odyssey, but it wasn't an adventure movie. It was pure, pure heavy sci-fi, which is a very different experience. But this really just transported people in a way story-wise and taking them on an adventure that that even 2001 didn't do and and it did it several times and like matt said like you're growing with the characters and it's a whole journey and it's quite amazing and the funny thing it's it's essentially like the godfather in space <laughs> you know we don't think about it very often but these movies were made around when the godfather was made they're both about the same themes it's just that one is with the mafia and the other one's in space. Uh, very, very similar movies, just completely different executions. And and those two people were friends. You know, they talked about their stories and ideas. Um, so, yeah, no, it's it's special. It's it's tough to put it into words. And I guess that's why it mattered once they tried to recapture that again and again. Whether it was Lucas with the prequels and then J.J. Abrams. Um, Ryan Johnson and a few others that the standalone movies, which I'm sure we'll briefly touch on all of them. And it's tough. It's tough to recapture that magic. Some of them did it better than others. It's really unique in cinema history, just the way that it was done. I think I I I, I poo poo on uh, people that think that Marvel has come remotely close to what Star Wars did. Um, mm -hmm. You know, as far as uh, creating a complete universe and, and just, you know, just with three movies, not with 26 or 45, however many movies they made. Uh, I really think it's on a, on a different level. And um, kudos to George Lucas. At least he gave us that, even if he couldn't sustain it much after the, the first three. Good to know and refreshing hearing you guys uh, kind of give your take and everything is um I, I was concerned i was gonna have to actually make a case here you know <laughs> yeah i um I, I think all of that was really well put i would definitely agree with all of it um i um for me um you if you might you might remember when we were talking about like our our favorite movies or something like that i think we said we were talking about our, our 11 to 20s or something like that uh, mm -hmm. a while back 
I mentioned that I had made this list, but I, I was a list that excluded Star Wars. Um, <clears throat> I wasn't putting them on there at all because I, when I think about movies, I don't even add these to them because I can't really be objective about it. I, I feel like Star Wars to me is like so much more than just movies. In junior college, I wrote a whole paper on Star Wars. I, I've like watched Star Wars all the time. I watch it when I'm sick. I watched it when I was in the hospital. I uh, try to marathon as many of them as I can on uh, once a, a year <laughs> on uh, Star Wars Day and stuff like that. I mean, it's just uh, in a week and a half, I'm going to go to Anaheim and go to a celebration and <laughs> I'll be spend four days immersed in Star Wars, you know, <laughs> um, for the fourth time now. To me, it's just uh, it's almost like a like a lifestyle. <laughs> I, I do think that the original trilogy the uh, the holy trilogy i do think that they're like the best movies ever made they're definitely not perfect but um like we were talking about that uh, a while back one of the other days kind of that distinction between a perfect movie and like the best movie you know like you can talk about a movie that achieved what it was trying to do perfectly and that there's not a single thing you could possibly change about it or you'd want to change about it that would be like a perfect movie but then a, another movie could still be a, of higher quality and something that you'd want to see more, something that's a better movie, even though it's still flawed. That's kind of how I think about Star Wars <clears throat> when I think about it as a filmmaker. And I think about it like try to, trying to be objective. I see the flaws and I see things that should have been done a little differently. But still, the overall impact, the overall effect, the overall quality, um, I, I can't think of anything better. Um, I, I do think that they're... Um, Certainly the best trilogy ever made, for sure. Yeah. So what about your, um, do you want to start with your um, your list of things we don't miss? Yeah, in no particular order. One thing, I this kind of flows easily into this from what we were just saying, but um, when you talk about Star Wars, a lot of times there's kind of like different camps that, where, that you can kind of put people in when it comes to Star Wars fans and Star Wars not so much fans, but critics, but uh, uh, people who are heavily critical of Star Wars. But um, even within the fans, within the people who love Star Wars, there's kind of like these defined camps that you see people in. And <clears throat> it's very easy. You see a lot of people talking a lot of trash about George Lucas, especially back 15 years ago or so, just after his trilogy, uh, the prequel trilogy was finished. You had a lot of people kind of upset about that and that coming on the tail end of the special edition release where he made a bunch of changes to the original trilogy. Um, there's a whole documentary called The People versus George Lucas, or I think it might be called, I think that's what it's called. Yeah, where it really delves into the, at the, the fandom and everything and the people and how they feel about it. I, I just wanted to say one one thing very clearly that I think George Lucas is like, he's nothing short of a, a visionary filmmaker. He is a mediocre director and he's a pretty bad writer, but you know, uh, he's a visionary filmmaker and his ability to craft like a, I guess a, I'd call it like a detailed lived in world, you know, that his story takes place in. It's on par with like Tolkien, CS Lewis, um, Frank Herbert, George R. R. Martin, Edgar Rice Burroughs, like all those great guys. The only real difference that I see that's like the, that really sets him apart and for better or worse, probably worse uh, than all of those people I just mentioned is that they're all authors who wrote books and he is a filmmaker. Well, I would than... correct it just to say that he's, he's a storyteller more than a filmmaker, like a, a better storyteller than he is a filmmaker. Oh, absolutely. That's what I'm trying to yeah. get at. That's yeah, because you were saying filmmaker, I mean, and I really think he's if he's not a, a I mean, he's, he made, he's not he a good American director. Graffiti. He made Star Wars, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, he's made. He's directed some good <laughs> movies, but but I, I do think it was this really like luck more than anything else early on that he lucked out with the right actors, the right circumstances. Absolutely. But you saw that he couldn't have sustained it, and well, that's, that's why he was. It. He's a he's a mediocre director and a bad writer. Yeah, but but, the fact that he was but, able to come up with this this world where it's like it's such a rich world and all you have to do is live in that world for a while and suddenly you can think of all sorts of stories to tell in it you know 
Yeah, yeah it, and he repeated it with with uh, Indiana Jones. Like he's just yeah. very good at creating worlds, but choosing the right people to take on the task. Yeah. 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 I, actually, uh, I, we've already brought up um, you know The Godfather, and there mm. there was a documentary that I saw several years back. For the life of me, I can't remember what it was, but uh, it was about American Zoetrope. You know, the, the like a bunch of those guys who like went to USC and, you know, like this basic, you know, basically like this consortium of uh, a bunch of talented filmmakers who were trying to, uh, you know, create this collective and, and push forward. And um, uh, Francis Ford Coppola and George Lucas both talked about how when they both started American Zoetrope. Uh, Francis Ford Coppola was asking George Lucas, like, why don't, why don't you try to write something? And George Lucas said, uh, because I can't write. And Francis Ford Coppola kind of egged him on a bit and said, yeah, well, just, just give it a shot. Just give it a shot. And so George Lucas went, went away and, and, and wrote, wrote a script, gave it to Francis Ford Coppola, Francis Ford Coppola read it, and his first reaction was, "Yeah, you're right. You can't write." Yep. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, I mean, George Lucas is an idea guy, and there's there's no scoffing at being an idea guy. You know, not, like, not in the film industry, anyways. It's a very um, what do you call it? Um, collaborative art. Uh, I, I mean, it's the most collaborative art form of which I'm aware. I can't think of one that's more so. I mean, how many art forms are there that, you know, like, you know, after the movie's over, you sit there for three minutes watching a scroll of names, <laughs> some kind of contribution to making it happen. I mean, it, it's just, uh, yeah, it, it, it it's an art form that's born out of pain and fighting and hurt and you know hurt feelings and <laughs> uh, uh and just trying to find a meeting of the minds to actually create a cohesive product so yeah um yeah there there's there's something to scoff at you know in in that term of just being an idea person which i think that george lucas ultimately is uh and yeah i think that the star wars prequels would have been better if he brought in you know a better writer like you know david mamet or stuart beatty or you know one of those other guys to just kind of you know, tweak the dialogue and well, get, I think he tried to. I'll have to plead ignorance on that. Um, but yeah, I, I don't want to talk too much about things that I I don't have any confirmation of, but um, that the story th there is this, the story that I've been told is that he did attempt to go to a, a number of his friends and try to have them help him, but um, some of them had good reasons not to want to, and others, um, uh, not so good reasons, but um. And it's all very fishy to me. I'm not sure exactly why. Um, <clears throat> my theory is that he burned some bridges a long time ago. Yeah, that doesn't surprise me too much. But yeah, yeah. So it's, it's too bad if if the whole prequel thing would have started like five years later, we might have had like a Nolan trilogy. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Uh, yeah. Instead, of, instead of a Batman trilogy. But I don't know. Maybe it's good that we have the Dark Knight. Hard to say. Yeah. And he did have the whole Batman thing on the apartment and the <laughs> following. So, so I guess it was <laughs> destined to be uh, that he'll do a Batman trilogy. So what what was on your list, Jason? That um... Oh, um, well, <clears throat> this one's kind of a longer one. It's not as defined. But um, OK, so this kind of is an all encompassing thing I just kind of wanted to talk about. But a lot of times we've been talking about movies and somebody not even necessarily the three of us, but like, you'll see this online all the time too. Um, Star Wars will come up in conversation with people a, in a critical way. You'll hear people talking and it's interesting because you hear a lot of the same arguments and the same complaints about things. And a lot of it's very legitimate. Uh, there's plenty of reasons to be upset, 
when you look at how good the original trilogy is versus the, you know, the movies that came after it. And I just, I, I wanted to point out that I think a lot of what you see, um, there's a lot of different types of Star Wars fans, I guess is what I'm trying to say. And there's, you can see the lines, you can really see the camps that people are in, you know, and it's, there's a lot of reasons why these camps form, but, um, and I, I know I'm oversimplifying it right now when I say this, but, um, you can actually almost kind of draw the lines down generational lines. It's, uh, it's pretty, pretty accurate to do so. It's not a hundred percent of course, but, um, you have like the older, like Gen Xers and the boomers, Star Wars fans, they got to like see the movies in theaters, you know, and then there's the younger Gen X fans and older millennials who kind of grew up with Star Wars as part of the culture, but um, not like it is now at all. And then you have like the younger millennials and the, the Zoomer fans who have grown up and spent most of their life in what we could easily say is like today's society where it's kind of nerd culture has kind of gone mainstream, not kind of in a big way has gone mainstream. And th there's really pretty easy to define those three camps. But um, a lot of people talked about toxic fandom and toxic fans and stuff like that, especially right out right in the midst of the last trilogy coming out, like with uh, the last Jedi and stuff like that. There was a lot of, hate being slung around online really unnecessarily really stupid stuff that was really dumb but it's just kind of what happened you know many people were seriously pissed off about the disney trilogy uh I, I really feel like a lot of those people not all of them of course but a lot of them are people who just kind of that third group that i was talking about people or or if not them just uh people who basically found their love of star wars and their their fandom in the last 20 years or so. And the reason I say that is because, you know, if you look back, the lore and the canon of Star Wars, it's it's changed many times over the decades. People tend to kind of feel like it only started changing a bit when they made the, 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 the prequels or when they did the special edition alterations and stuff like that. But really, stuff has been changing a lot over the last uh, few decades. Most of my life, I would even say, this may sound a little, I don't know, narcissistic or something, but like, I feel like people like me who've read a lot of comics and just like totally devoured the Star Wars expanded universe books and stuff like that. I just feel like we were better prepared for the difficulties and the disappointments that came with the Disney trilogy. Because if you've read comic books in the past, or if you read like those books I was just talking about, which um, for anyone who doesn't know, there's there's uh, dozens and dozens, if not hundreds, of Star Wars books that were written between the early '90s and today. If you've read and consumed a bunch of that stuff, um, you kind of get used to the idea of the stories that you're reading being written by a whole bunch of different people, and uh, that it's not going to be perfect. You know, like you start getting used to the idea that someone has made an installment into the story that you love and that installment has problems with it. There's something that doesn't line up right. There's an inconsistency or or, or a, a continuity error or it just sucks. Like they do just did a piss poor job because they didn't care. But one way or another, like you get used to just kind of creating your own headcanon. And that's definitely what you have to do when you're reading a lot of comic books or um, if you read a whole bunch of Star Wars books throughout the 90s. And so <clears throat> I think a lot of people just weren't ready for that. And if they just grew up in the last 25 years and all they know of Star Wars is, you know, the, 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 the movie, the original movies, and then the prequels, and then they, they didn't really know of anything else, and then suddenly in their head it all lines up okay, at least good enough anyway. And maybe they're not too bothered by the horrible problems with the prequels. And then all of a sudden the Disney trilogy comes out and they're like, just, they don't know what to do with themselves. You know, they're just like at a loss. Cause they're just like, why is this thing that I love being messed up so badly? Well, yeah. I, I think it is true. And, um, you know, there's the whole separation of the, uh, people who, are okay with the Ewoks and the people who are not. There's always like these subcultures within 
uh, Star Wars fandom of Absolutely. like the separation between like people who are cool with this, not cool with that. And and I think that's interesting. And maybe with the way we can lead into it, um, and Matt, if you have anything to add before we go into this, um, uh, I, th I think we should do rankings because maybe that'll help us delve deeper into it. But not, all, not only of all the movies, I, I think we should first um, rank the trilogies and and then go into like the movies. Um, but Matt, I don't know if you had anything to add about the uh, the subculture fandom thing. I, 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 like, if I start talking about J.J. Abrams, I'm going to be talking for about 20 minutes. So might as well just <laughs> might as well just do, uh, uh, jump into the uh, the rankings. Yeah, so my thinking about the rankings, um, because I think if we give a trilogy ranking, which will be fairly simple, although I don't think we'll be divided on it, but it'll be interesting to see. But it's more the movies I'm sure will be divided on, and then we can get into a discussion about the specific movies. Uh, for me, obviously, the original trilogy is number one. Um, I thought about this with the prequel and the sequel, because... Uh, I I don't know if the prequels did the right thing. I, I think it. What's great about the original trilogy is the fact that it started halfway into the story. That there was so much backstory that we didn't know, and it made the whole thing exciting because there's so much to discover about the past. But then once we went back, it, it was probably worth going back there, but not in the way that it was done. Like it was nice to see all those moments. Uh, and there were some things that were added that maybe weren't thought of initially. Um, so so I, I, in, in some ways, I do feel like the prequel trilogy is second, like it's better than the sequel trilogy, only because I felt that the sequel trilogy, especially the first and last movies, were mostly just mirroring the original trilogy with the new generation. It was like the next generation, only it's not good like next generation in Star Trek where they build on top of it. I felt like The Last Jedi, like Ryan Johnson was trying to do that. Uh, and maybe a little bit of Rogue One was doing that too. But but the uh, the Force Awakens and Rise of Skywalker really just um, were pandering to fans. Member berries, <laughs> and you're just people that just wanted to get the same feel, but it it it, it lost. There was no originality. There was no soul to it. it. It was basically just missing the point of what Star Wars was, which was taking inspiration from other, you know, mediums and and other movies and and mixing it together. But but this was just taking stuff from the original trilogy and mixing it together, which is not that doesn't make it as much sense which is why i think rehashing yeah which is why i think like the mandalorian and some of those shows they really went back and said like oh you know star wars was a western in space so let's have a gunslinger and you know it was based on samurai movies so let's have samurai settings and things like that so so they went back to the original material Instead of just go stopping at the movies, which is what you should have done with the, the sequel trilogy, but never did. And, and I'll, I'll say, Lucas, in the prequel trilogy, I don't think he drew much on other material for it. He just drew on his own trilogy. So he made the same mistake that J.J. Abrams did in the sequel trilogy. He, he rehashed... Uh, oh, there's like lightsaber fights, there's this, there's that. And he just like took it to the extreme because he had that technology. But there was no in inspiration there. There was nothing there that was... The only thing was maybe there was the, the whole thing with the the pod racing thing was, was something that he really wanted to do because of the whole... And that was a, kind of a cool sequence, but not... Maybe he needed more of that. More just bringing in other stuff from other genres, from other um, so, ma material and wove it into the into the universe as opposed to just oh let's go back and see what happened when this met that and this met that um so but still i, I do feel believe that the prequel was more worthwhile than the sequel trilogy i, I don't know if, if any of us are going to disagree with that because i i've heard matt talk about the sequel trilogy so um <laughs> yeah 
pretty sure. Uh, I think it's pretty clear cut. I think that the original trilogy is by far the best. I think the prequels were kind of a wasted uh, opportunity. Um, they, I, I do love them. Uh, I love a lot of stuff about all three of those movies. Uh, but I have, I, I'm not going to go into it because I know this would would be like its own. Th- this is just not the place for it. I have a like an eight page treatment that I've written titled how the prequels should have been. I mean, like I I've literally put so much thought into this and had so many conversations with other people. It, but I, when I say that, I mean that I, I do like them. I just think that they're very, very flawed. And there's things that were like some of the stuff Gil just said that were not done right about them. And they're definitely nowhere near as good as star Wars, as the original trilogy. But if for no other reason at all, all you have to do is look at the third movies. I mean, uh, Revenge of the Sith is the best of the three uh, of the prequel trilogy, prequel movies. It, it ends on a pretty good note that's uh, got its own problems, of course, but pretty solid. And the the Rise of Skywalker, the third film in the Disney trilogy, is so, so bad. It's um, It's really bad. So <laughs> that would be my easy ranking right there. Hmm. Interesting. Uh, mine would be a little different, but I guess we can get to the movies. So, Matt, so we're assuming your same order as far as the trilogies. Yeah, it, yeah, the same order. Um, I, I mean, obviously, the original trilogy is a cinematic masterpiece. I mean, it's just phenomenal. It's wonderful. It, it, it you know, the, it, I, I, I mean, it shaped my childhood it, it it changed me as a human being in ways that most actual people have not changed me original trilogy f- fucking fantastic the prequel trilogy is a distant second you know there are a lot of components that go into it uh one is i think george lucas broke a lot of his own rules I mean, you know, no matter how cool the lightsaber fight between Qui-Gon and Obi-Wan and uh, Darth Maul was, uh, you know, you already kind of established in Return of the Jedi that it takes a little bit of concentration and force power to just jump up on a, like, stairwell, you know, uh, you know, uh, that's like, you know, 18 feet up or something. And then suddenly we're watching this lightsaber battle and people are able to jump like six stories in the air and it doesn't seem to bother them at all. Uh, You know, there are a lot of those problems. And then, you know, you get even into revenge of the Sith where you have the uh, up in your eyes, Anakin, the Sith are evil. Well, from my point of view, the Jedi are evil. Well, then you are truly lost. You know, uh, you know the, those kinds of exchanges that are just kind of laughing. That's that Lucas dialogue right there. Yeah, uh, yeah. The, the, it, you know, it's just bad. It's just not sweet, really, sweet it, Lucas dialogue. <laughs> <laughs> it's just not very good dialogue. And then you get into the Disney uh, trilogy. I know that I'm going to get a lot of flack for this because I've already gotten a lot of flack for this. The Last Jedi is not a good movie. Uh, and I've come around to accepting that. But Ryan Johnson has gotten way too much flack for that because J.J. Abrams gave him literally nothing to work with. I, I mean, all uh, all J.J. Abrams did... And I, I respect J.J. Abrams. Yeah, I respect I respect J.J. Abrams for at least going back to shooting on film and making it look pretty. I mean, yeah. like yeah, practical the, effects. Yeah, the the movies look pretty, and I will give J.J. Abrams respect for that. But holy Jesus, Jew. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, that's the second time that I've said that. Um, I mean, well, it, this is a messianic story, so <laughs> 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 I, 
I, I, in Empire Strikes Back, Luke has already been, you know, associated with Obi Wan at least. He's gotten at least a little bit of training. You know, he's hanging upside down, and it takes him a lot of concentration just to pull his lightsaber out of the snow from a few feet away in order to escape. And then suddenly Ray, who has no training, who has no experience, who has never touched a lightsaber in her life, can not only pull a lightsaber into her hand from like 20 yards away, but she can overpower Kylo Ren. (laughs) J.J. Abrams gave Ryan Johnson literally nowhere to go. Yeah. Well, but I guess that's why they had to make her uh, Palpatine's granddaughter or something, because only someone like that can pull off that kind of force. Uh, The Rise of Skywalker, that was the first Star Wars movie that I actually saw. The credits rolled. I came out of the theater and said, I have no need to ever see this movie again. It seems like more and more I need to see it again, because... um... To throw a wrench in there, as far as like my preferences, because uh, Jason mentioned about Revenge of the Sith being the best one of the uh, prequels, and I need to revisit those as well, I guess. I don't know. I have a recollection of, especially the prequel trilogy, that I, I really enjoyed Attack of the Clones, just because The Phantom Menace was so disappointing that Attack of the Clones <clears throat> made up for it because my expectations were so low. And then Revenge of the Sith just had so many cringy moments that I've always basically said, like, "Ah, I think of all those movies, probably Attack of the Clones was the least heartbreaking. Hmm. Um, But, and then as far as the sequel trilogy, I should revisit The Last Jedi. Maybe it is a lesser movie than I thought it is. I I feel like in many ways, it's kind of like a Snyder movie. The way I see Snyder movies like Man of Steel and others, where like he, Ryan Johnson just really swung for the fences and he did some good stuff. It wasn't as solid as what they were doing in Rogue One, where they brought real life and 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 brought back metaphor into um, Star Wars. You know, because the original one was about the Nazis and, and all that. And, and then felt like with Rogue One and The Last Jedi, they really brought back the whole thing about the rebellion being a metaphor for what a rebellion is in the real world or in Rogue One, where it's like, are we the terrorists? Is this ethical? And all these interesting questions, which is what you should do in a Star Wars movie. If if, if one thing that Lucas didn't do in the originals and you can bring bring into the picture is like, yeah, they work on those metaphors, so like just play with them a bit. And, and none of that was in The Force Awakens in The Rise of Skywalker. But as far as story is concerned, I don't know why. Maybe it was just the end of the trilogy. And yeah, it was pretty lookout. But but I really felt like The Rise of Skywalker was, to me, a satisfying ending in some odd way. Like, I, I didn't think it was a great movie, but I thought it was satisfying. It, it tied everything together. It was not as good as The Last Jedi. But at least it wasn't a carbon copy the way The Force Awakens was to to A New Hope. Like, I, that's that's what I appreciated about it, that they did some stuff differently there, even if it wasn't a very good movie. Uh, I th- we, we should I, definitely talk about the overall rankings then. I'm yeah, very yeah. curious to see what you have to say about that. <laughs> yeah, so I don't know if, uh, if maybe uh, you or Matt want to start and then I'll... Oh, jeez. Um... <laughs> even in the original one, we'll have some, uh, I'm sure, disagreements. I, I mean, I, I might actually want to start at the bottom. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> See, it's tough for me to start at the bottom because, like, there would be a lot of movies tied there, potentially. So, I, I have mine written down. Mine's pretty easy. Empire, Jedi, uh, A New Hope, and uh, just barely in that order. All three of those are amazing. Um, I I don't really have any particular reason I, I don't I don't have any beef with if anybody's saying that like one of them's better than the other. They're all excellent. Um, I think that Rogue One is easily the fourth best out of all of those movies. A step down below that would be Revenge of the Sith in the fifth position. Then I think there's a big drop before 
you get to uh, kind of the area where it's like Attack of the Clones and the Solo movie. Uh, below that, I would say um, like a weird three-way tie area. Um, hard to really for me to put one above the other, but um, The Last Jedi, The Force Awakens, and The Phantom Menace. And then significantly below that, I'd put would be uh, ri- The Rise of Skywalker at the very last position. Hmm. Okay. I, I I might have to just um, focus on the Skywalker, you know, the those nine movies. A New Hope and Return of the Jedi are basically tied for me. Hmm. Uh, for, for one, uh, I I mean Empire is a freaking classic. I just knock it down a few points because I don't think that is a, a complete movie. You know, there, there's really, it, it, I mean, it ends on a cliffhanger. So I, I'm, I'm always going to kind of knock it down a little bit. But I, I really love Empire. Then uh, again, distant fourth or whatever uh, would be Revenge of the Sith, the Clone Wars. Then I think I would slide. When you say uh, Clone Wars, you mean Attack of the Clones? Attack of the Clones. Uh, 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 sorry, yeah. Attack- <laughs> not not the uh, the Clone Wars, the animated. Right. Oh, thank, thank you for the correction. Yes, yeah, so Attack of the Clones. Then I would slide in the Last Jedi, and then the Phantom Menace, and then after that I would have the Force Awakens. And then I would have like seven miles of shit, and under that I would put the Rise of Skywalker. So ours aren't that far apart. Yeah. You, aside from the fact that you didn't you didn't put a place for the the two Rogue standalone One solo. Yeah. Where would you place them if you had to? Uh, uh, Rogue One. Um, the fact that it was shot by Greg Fraser is always going to give give it a, a boost for me. So uh, I, I I think I would pro I would probably put it like on par with revenge of the Sith. Mm. Uh, solo. Jeez. That was really forgettable. Solo is a well-made movie and it, it, it is a movie that absolutely did not need to be ever be made. That's yeah. the biggest problem. It, well, it's two biggest problems are that it didn't need to be made. And for the amount of story they were trying to tell, they should not have tried to make a trilogy or a single movie. They should have made it into a Disney plus nine to 10 part uh, hour long miniseries. It almost feels like uh, Solo is, should be part of the prequels. <laughs> like it pretty much did the same thing as the prequels. It was all about just let's see all those moments that like we know about and were discussed, but but weren't shown in, in the original trilogy. It's just like his life stretches out over a long period of time to try and condense all of those things that, that, that shaped him and that we all knew about the stories and events to try and put that into one movie. was really stupid to try and stretch it into a trilogy on its own is even stupider. You should have just made a mini series out of it. Also, they intended on doing that, but they stopped short because the movie was not. Yeah. It didn't make enough money. They they were, that was supposed to be the first of three movies. That would have been stupid. Right. Right, I mean, visually it was pretty. You know, Acting was good. Visually it was good. The music was wonderful. The um, script was okay. I don't know. I, I think it's somewhere in the middle of you know the you know the prequel uh, the prequels in terms of rankings. It's just but, a I, mean, movie. I, I mean, at least they didn't rape the character of Han Solo. Uh, they did some bad stuff to. They to, they did some uh, bad. Just, but okay but but they didn't (laughs) they didn't go full force awakens so okay yeah but i I like that approach i might take that same approach and ranking just to focus on the yeah the trilogies and then and then squeeze those in where they make sense (laughs) um yeah, so I, I think I'm kind of with Matt. The funny thing is, when I growing up, Return of the Jedi was my favorite Star Wars movie because it's the climax. Uh, how are so you? Good. A kid is always gonna like the climax. So good. I mean, that movie basically, and this is the argument I made about the Emperor Strikes Back. Always, it's basically the end of Act Two and Act Three of the Empire Strikes Back. Like the and uh, the movie is two hours and thirty minutes in. It's basically an hour and a half of climax. 
which has never been done. That just doesn't happen. I think maybe the Lord of the Rings, maybe like the last one, comes. I was going to say that. Lord of the Rings is kind of like that, but yeah. But that's a three-hour movie. This is a two-hour movie where basically yep. they rescue Han, and it's all climax. <laughs> that's it. The whole movie is a climax. Um, that's why it's so good. But over the years, I've learned to appreciate that uh, A New Hope is uniquely one of the best movies ever made, just structurally. Just the characters, the pacing, how everything falls in line, the princess, the the wannabe rescuer, the scoundrel who doesn't want to get involved but gets involved in the end. I, I don't think it's been matched. So I do think as I've grown older, I, I, I think I would put A New Hope at number one. Return of the Jedi a close second. The Empire Strikes Back, I've, I've always thought, was like a half a movie. Like, I literally thought, because our tape, like, tore out exactly when the movie ended. Like, it, it went to, like, to snow, TV snow. And I was like, well, where's the rest of the movie? Like, I really thought there was more than that movie. That's how bad I, I perceived it. But as I watched it as, a, as an adult and stuff, I understood, okay, I get it. It was a, it was a bad ending in the be- in the middle, and it was... Significant enough because of the whole reveal with Darth Vader and, and Luke Skywalker. So I appreciate it, but still, like Matt said, definitely number third. Because it's just, I don't think it's the way to, to do a trilogy. But that's but that's uh, fine. And uh, and then from there, yeah, it, it's tough for me. I, I really think The Last Jedi did something that none of the prequels did. Which was to bring something fresh to Star Wars. But still, like have some of the original uh, like Luke coming back there and and saving the day and all that um that was very reminiscent reminiscent of like to me actually of Attack of the Clones in some ways cuz Attack of the Clones if I'm not mistaken was the one that uh where Yoda fought Dooku right That's correct yeah Yeah so to me those two moments made those movies Yoda pulling a lightsaber and oh Luke oh showing God showing up in the battle to me was just like i was in childhood heaven basically and for those reasons alone i I feel like those two would come after probably the last jedi first then attack of the clones then revenge of the sith and probably uh and then i would just make it a tier and then the phantom menace the force awakens the rise of skywalker would be the bottom tier uh, it's very tough for me to choose between them because because I think all three of them are essentially bad movies, uh, you know, like just not good movies. Um, so they will be interchangeable for me. But but still, what was the bottom tier again? I'm sorry. Oh, the Phantom Menace, The Force Awakens, and The Rise of Skywalker. Okay. Yeah, I would give The Phantom Menace a slight edge. For, it, for some of it was shot on film. The Phantom Menace. Yeah, a little bit. That's true. Okay, that's it doesn't matter to me, but <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, no, it's it's tough. I I think The Force Awakens is a, is a captivating movie. It's good. It's well made. The Rise of Skywalker, I said, was a satisfying ending, and maybe I should give it a slight edge over the the other two, but um, but yeah, they're basically like a bottom tier for me. And then as far as Rogue One and Solo, I think Rogue One has to be around where the Last Jedi is, maybe above it. Because it is uh, has less issues than The Last Jedi, but it was still brought something new to Star Wars while still bringing in a lot from what was there. And Solo probably would be around where Attack of the Clones is, like just below that, uh, above the bottom tier. Because I did enjoy moments of it. Uh, it just didn't live up to what a, a Solo movie should be as far as the charisma... The the adventure it just wasn't yeah. as good like that that movie should have been at least as good as like at least half as good as a new hope or return of the jedi that, that like the material was there you had a great character all you needed to do is have fun with it and and they tried but they didn't succeed yeah it's interesting um if if we all were in the same room and had a bunch of whiteboards in front of us and we were like placing these things it would be a lot more apparent than just listening to us but um there wasn't a whole lot of you know, variation there. We all pretty much put them roughly in the same spots, more or less. Yeah, yeah. although you both put Revenge of the Sith above Attack of the Clones, so. Uh, yeah. 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 Um, 
I, I, I mean, honestly, though, it, it it's just one of those things where when it comes to J.J. Abrams, I mean, I just think he he makes a, at least with his last several movies, he's made a career out of being emotionally manipulative. Like, yeah. you know, like he has no balls left. I, I, I mean, you know, I, oh, oh, Chewy got blown up. Oh, wait, no, it turned out that he was on that other transport that we didn't see on this planet that has like zero people on it. Oh, that's all fine. Oh, we've got this great moment where C-3PO is sacrificing his memory so he can interpret this fucking dagger thing and... Uh, I'm taking one last look at my friends before my memory gets wiped. Oh, but, you know, it's all fine because C-3PO has his memory in his own memory banks and he can just inject it back into him and, you know, there's no cost at all to this. I I mean, like, the, the, the guy is just manipulating human beings all the time. In his movies, I, I, and and again, it, it like just goes into Star Trek too. Like, oh, hey, I, you know, Kirk just Kirk just sacrificed his life saving the Enterprise, uh, copying Wrath of Khan. Oh, but I, hey, you know, we all we need is Khan's blood, even though we have seventy three other people who have the, who had the same blood as Khan right next to us oh just just bring in Khan uh, alive and we can inject Kirk with his super blood and you know we can cure death and yet now there are no stakes anymore I mean like seriously fuck that guy in the fucking neck yeah uh, not, not <laughs> very strong opinions <laughs> uh, I mean it, I, if you want I could talk about all the problems with the, with those movies as well but it just it's it's a lot well, you had. Uh, I'm. I'm curious because you reacted to me saying about Yoda pulling out a lightsaber. Um, oh, I was just gonna say, yeah. When you said that, I mean, there's. God, I, I could talk about all the positive things of all the Star Wars movies, but um, when you brought that up, it's just. I was like 18 years old when that movie came out. I remember. It's not just that Yoda fights finally, and that was like I've been waiting for that for a long time. You know, way before there was ever even going to be a prequel, you know, trilogy. I remember going to a, a, a store somewhere that had a bunch of star Wars paraphernalia and star Wars stuff. And some, some person out there made a little like eight inch, 10 inch tall figurine of like, and they, they titled it young Jedi Yoda or something like that. When he was supposed to be in his prime or something, it's like Yoda with a lightsaber. And I was just like, Oh, that would be crazy to see that as a little kid. You know, I was thinking that, but like you said, the moment he walks in the room, he doesn't just pull his lightsaber out. He does like a, like an Eastwood. He like grabs his, his, his robe, like, like, like it's a duster, you know, and pulls it out of the way, uh, you know, to, to reveal where his lightsaber is and then uses the force to pull it into his other hand. It's like, it's the most baller move I've, I'd ever seen in my life. I was just like, oh, yes. <laughs> yeah, no, it's uh, it's something, uh, even though it totally feeds into the no- nostalgia part of it, it, it felt almost obligatory. Like, it felt like like we needed that. He is younger back then. Uh, he's not in his prime, but because he has the force, he's capable of mustering something. Yeah, and I don't think they overdo his powers. If anything, you know who would make sense would jump around like a crazy person, like a frog, would be Yoda, not actual humans, like yeah. what they did with like you know Obi Wan and you know like. Uh, so that's that's um, and th- and that bothers me. I think Matt brought that up. I I I don't know why all of a sudden gravity changed. You know, like between the original trilogy and the prequels. If this was ba- based on samurai movies and 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 westerns nobody was doing somersaults you know like maybe i i think luke luke did some stuff yeah he did like a little bit but don't overdo it it's just the right amount like the, i think I, I get why people complain about that stuff i think it's a twofold problem number one there, there's no question that 
the Obi-Wan Darth Vader li lightsaber duel in the original Star Wars movie, A New Hope, suffers from their lack of money, their lack of time, their lack of budget, their lack of technology, their lack of everything. Because just two to three years later, they are able they have the budget and the time and all that stuff. And they get the same actor playing Vader, the same clunky costume, and Luke is there fighting him, and it is 20 times better. That is my still to this day, my favorite lightsaber duel in all of Star Wars. Um, and it it's it feels so real. They're really hacking at each other, especially at the end when they're on the catwalk. It, it's not slow, it's not clunky, it's not anything like that, but it's also not they don't go too crazy with it either but it's supposed to be a like a an apprentice he's not supposed to be a fully trained jedi yet uh he does do some flips and jumps and he's he he does jump uh really far out of the carbon freezing chamber and uh stuff like that and then in the next couple of movies he does some some cartwheels and flips in the air when in the um in the 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 death star throne room the emperor's throne room and stuff like that but you know, it, it wasn't overdone. It was fine, and I think in the prequels, the other to to talk about the other side of the problem, I don't really see the speed at which that they're fighting to be that big of a problem. It's fine. Matt mentioned, I think it's in he's he was talking about um, the Phantom Menace. There's a part where. Obi-Wan Kenobi is like falls off of something and he lands on another catwalk and he's like really far down and he just kind of uses the force to just sort of whoop and just kind of jumps right up there no big deal kind of thing and it's like that wasn't even something that affected the fight that much so th that was some a really bad choice like, like you know because it's like why why even put that in there just have him go catch up with them and and keep fighting and stuff um in the second one, I guess you do get to see Yoda jumping around a lot, but you don't see too much craziness. Uh, it's really some of the stuff in the um, the Emperor and Yoda doing their fight scene that was a little crazy. And yeah. The, um, <laughs> the I don't know if it's been topped yet, but the um, just throwing the trivia out there: the Obi Wan Kenobi, um, Anakin Skywalker, Darth Vader, whatever fight in Revenge of the Sith when it was made it was the longest duel in any movie that existed. Most of it, I think is really good. Um, I think the beginning when they're in the inside the building is really well choreographed. Some of it is a little too close. The, the camera's a little too close. So we don't really get to see how good that some of it is. And some of the editing is not perfect. And then they get outside the stuff where they're on the big pylon is kind of stupid and i really wish they could have just got, kind of get to the the mo the meat of it where they're um they're out on the lava thing that was necessary i mean some people complained about it but i mean uh, since i don't know how long i i really don't know where i got this information from but ever since i was a kid i i th i'd read somewhere in some book you know about the thing where they george lucas had talked enough about the past that he said that Darth Vader's injury that led to all his stuff involved a fight with Obi-Wan and, and hot lava. So like, I mean, it kind of, we all kind of knew it was coming. So, you know, everyone complained about, a lot of people complained about it, but it's like, you know, it was kind of necessary. That's what they had said it happened. But yeah. um, I, I think that you can definitely key in on a few particular bad decisions that were made when it comes to them jumping around and, and stuff. But um, for the most part, I, I think it's it's pretty good. It's just um, that it's it's the, the the it's the little things that annoy you. You know, it's like when you see a few things and you're like, that's the stuff that sticks with you. You know, like story wise, though. And uh, Jason, you can correct me if you 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 feel that I'm wrong in my assessment. I just taking the lightsaber battle in Empire versus. Uh, the uh, uh, the lightsaber battle at the end of The Force Awakens. I mean, my impression watching that lightsaber battle at the end of Empire as an adult is that Luke was never actually threatening Vader. Like, Vader was toying with him. Vader could have killed him at any point. 
very easily. But that wasn't Vader's goal. Vader's goal was to convert Luke. It, his goal was never to kill Luke. If, if Vader's goal was to kill Luke, he would have done it. I, I mean, he was so outmatched. Luke was so outmatched in that battle that now when I when I'm watching it, I I'm thinking you know Vader could have just said, "Eh, fuck you," you know, just flick flick his lightsaber in one direction that Luke wasn't expecting and cut him in half. It would have been over, no problem, done. Uh, um, yeah, but, the, uh, the, I, but, think, I think that's a pretty fair assessment. Yeah, and, there, there is just just to be overly detailed. Um, there is a point uh, when they're on the catwalk where Luke tags him in the arm. I, I mean, in, again, I, I, I almost touched on this earlier about multiple authors and how you have to kind of take what they say and, and decide for yourself what <laughs> you feel. There is a, one author who wrote. A, a story it's not a particularly good one it's 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 in the better half of the stories that are out there but uh he's writing a scene with darth vader because um the book takes place between uh empire strikes back and return of the jedi and it's talk. It, it's a scene with darth vader and he's thinking back to that fight and um in this person's opinion and i would agree with it too that um there is a moment where uh after he's knocked him out the window and he goes down there and they start fighting on the catwalk where Luke really starts cutting loose. And for just a brief exchange, it seems like Vader is um, is actually in potential danger there. And uh, <laughs> that author described it as as like an exhilarating thing, like like that that Vader had it had been years and years and years since he had even had any sort of uh, fear of his own life, you know, or anything. And he was just like. Uh, it, it was over very quickly, of course, because he then lops his hand right off and regains control of the situation very quickly. I, I always thought that that was, uh, like you said, it it's definitely seems to be the case that Luke doesn't stand a chance, really. Yeah, and then you compare that to, again, you know, Ray at the end of The Force Awakens, and she's picking up a lightsaber for the first time in her life. And, you know, it, it, it's just amazing the amount of mental gymnastics that people go through of like, oh yeah, well, okay, sure. Kylo Ren got shot in the stomach by Chewbacca before he got into his fight with, uh, with Ray. So, you know, maybe he's using all of his force power to just keep his insides intact or something. Uh, come on, bullshit. No. <laughs> I mean, if you want my opinion, I think that the best lightsaber thing in all of the sequel trilogies is the the throne room fight with the crap what are they called they the red, the, the yeah the, the guys the guards dressed red. um there it's uh praetorians i think that that's the best fight in all three of those movies and that's not even a proper duel it's just a it's kind of like a weird melee fight and even that i have problems with because it's i i feel like if you're going to go through the amount of money and effort that you put into a star wars movie as much as I like that scene, there there's moments when you slow it down, you can see the lack of well choreographed stuff. Whatever, it, it's it's still the best thing in those three movies. I mean, from a storytelling point of view, as Matt said, I think that every lightsaber duel in those movies is lacking. Um, there's a, a, all kinds of stuff wrong with them, um, and if you want to start picking apart problems, yeah, it, it's, they're they're rife with problems. <laughs> As yeah. far as um, like the light, um, they did tone it down. I felt like in the sequels, they they brought it back to an in between level. There wasn't as many somersaults and, and fast paced as the prequel trilogy, sure. right? Yeah, it feels that way somewhat. Yeah, but I think what was lacking story wise, because we're talking about story, is the original fights in the original trilogy had so much weight to them. Like whether it's Obi Wan and Vader having this whole history, yeah. uh, that it's almost not about the fight. It's almost like between two Jedi's, it's it's shaking hands <laughs> going into a yeah. duel. Uh, that's pretty much what it is. Yeah, and it's almost like predetermined in some way. It was predetermined 
Like, uh, Obi went into that duel knowing he's going to get killed because he needed to do it for the reasons of Luke, you know, uh, going on his own journey. And then Vader needed to keep Luke alive, but still win in order to keep him on the path. Uh, uh, well, he's and, trying to turn him to the dark side. But he's trying to turn him, so he's trying to create anger in him and fear and, you know, all those emotions. Uh, and then and then he probably tries to bring it out again with the Emperor and the throne room, but only they don't succeed. Like, in the last moment, like, the anger is there, vengeance is there, everything is there, but, but he doesn't turn. Um, so that's the thing that I felt like they tried to do. It was very lacking in the prequel trilogy of all things, surprisingly. I mean, in the, I do agree that in Revenge of the Sith, there's more story placed into the duel than maybe the other ones. Uh, but the sequel trilogy, at least in the, like you said, the throne room, because because she's also battling. Or was it the Rise of Skywalker? I don't remember where it was where she's battling um, Kylo Ren again. And uh, uh, they fight. Uh, they fight outside on a weird metal bridge thing in in the third movie in Rise of Skywalker. Rise of Skywalker. Uh, the Last and, Jedi and was was in the throne room. The Last yeah. Jedi, they have a throne room thing, but they don't fight each other. They kind of like uh, fighting different people. They're fighting the Praetorians, yeah. Which, which I like that. That that was interesting. It was fresh. They were communicating, was. yeah, like, through it, and I thought that was a nice approach to like use because that's what the battles are supposed to be. They're supposed to tell a story, to to advance the story in some ways. Uh, and and I, and I felt like the, at least they tried it in The Last Jedi, and obviously it was there in the original, and a little bit in Revenge of the Sith, but but really I felt like Revenge of the Sith was just, uh, I mean, it was the climax of the trilogy, So and like you said, we knew it was coming with the lava and everything. It's just I wish some of the lines there would have been better. Like to, oh, to, to, oh, no. to, to mean, go it, from, like, I am your father to, oh. um, to like, you know, <sighs> well, I think the Sith are... Oh, <laughs> No, I mean, Are you truly lost. If we're talking about the story, what what it should be, that should be the most heartbreaking epic moment in all nine movies, without question. That we're talking about something where we were supposed to have gotten three movies. Again, this is what we should have gotten: three movies where we're showing Obi Wan and Anakin bonding and becoming like like as close as brothers to each other, you know. And then Anakin, you know, what we should have seen was a slow, deliberate story of him, you know, slowly turning to the dark side because, you know, and this this whole thing of like, he's this guy who has to walk on like a knife's edge kind of thing. So where it's like, he's just constantly trying to avoid falling off one side or the other. And then it, when the moment comes and he has to turn to the dark side, he makes the, that one decision and it's all or nothing. He, he turns to the dark side and from that point forward, nothing else matters. He's, he's That's what he's about at that point. I remember telling that to somebody. I was trying to defend those movies and I was talking to a friend of mine and I explained that to him and he goes, yeah, that sounds great. It's too bad that's not the movie we got. Yeah. <laughs> you know, because <laughs> I mean... <laughs> The story-wise, it's all there. It's just it's that's not the that's not the movie we got. You know, if if we'd gotten that and we had these two, or let's say I, I mean I, I I don't like all the hate that Hayden Christensen gets, but let's face it, he's not good in those movies. Uh, he's far better in other movies, and, and it's not even all his fault. It's terrible, terrible, terrible dialogue. You know, um, but and it's uh, funny how he's been kind of like re embraced by the fandom now with the Obi Wan show. Well, that, that's <laughs> it's not just the Obi Wan show, the entire prequels have been greatly embraced by fans again because, well, my theory is because they have something else to hate, <laughs> but uh, uh, maybe, yeah, it's like now we're longing for the prequel yeah, trilogy, exactly, yeah. Yeah. Which, which makes me roll my eyes really hard because, you know, I mean. Like, that's kind of what I was touching on earlier, not to go back to that, but like a lot of these people, they're kind of talking about how they, they love the prequels and they, they, they're so great and blah, blah, blah. And they, they really hate what Ryan Johnson did to ruin this, the sequel trilogy, blah, blah, blah. And in case you can't tell, I'm, I'm like rolling my eyes as I say that sarcastically. That's what the complaints you get. And it's like, yeah, I, 
I do think that the the last three movies they made were were very flawed and very problematic and some of the worst ones they've made overall. But let's not just forgive the prequels entirely. I mean, they have their own problems. <laughs> yeah. Um, actually, it was funny how, like, I, I think it was while Gil was talking that I was just kind of thinking that the fundamental story of the prequels was basically the story of the wind that shakes the barley. Only they had three movies. They only had three movies to do it. Yeah, pretty yeah. much. <laughs> and just utterly failed to do it. I, 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 I said utterly failed, but still did better than JJ Abrams. <laughs> <laughs> I, I still try to push people on this. I came out of The Last Jedi thinking that it was a lot better than it actually was. And that was because, you know, the it last... actual story. Right. Yeah, the last Star Wars movie that I saw was The Force Awakens. <laughs> and, you know, uh, The Last Jedi at least had some themes, you know, like failure is a better teacher than success. Uh, you, uh, you, uh, that you need to let go of the past in order to see the future sometimes. You know, like, it actually has some ideas behind it. Yeah, Admiral Holdo is a horrible human being uh, and a terrible leader and all that shit. And there are some really dumb characters in the movie. But at least it was trying to do something. <laughs> <laughs> oh, by the way, just a quick correction. Rogue One um, came in between The Force Awakens and The Last Jedi. So. Yeah. But I guess it was different enough that it wasn't... Uh, well, yeah. Didn't qualify. <laughs> <laughs> There's so much wrong with all three of those movies. It's uh, crazy. I, I don't know. I didn't really say this earlier, but I was going to mention it when we talked about ranking the movies. But... Um, as like a lifelong Star Wars fan and somebody who, well, I'll just say it. I mean, I rank these movies largely by just seeing um, how much did they screw up what came before it. So the th the movies that have the the most minimal impact and did the least damage to the Star Wars story are the ones I place higher. That's the reason, pretty much, why I would rank them the way I did. And yeah, I mean, those, the three, uh, episodes seven, eight, and nine all made a lot of huge major changes that really screw things up really badly. Not that the prequels didn't either. The prequels did a lot of damage on their own. But yeah, those three, they all have uh, a lot of issues for sure. Maybe we should get into this um, the before. Nitty -gritty. No, not the nitty gritty. I think we're already in there. <laughs> but. Um... But as far as, um, like, what's the magic sauce? Like, wh what do you think were the, we touched on it, but, like, maybe to get more specific, the ingredients in the original movies that are missing in the, um, in the prequels and sequels, um, you know, from your perspective, if you had to put it into words? I think that story-wise, the, the prequels had everything that they needed to be successful. I think they fail because George Lucas, like, like I said, this is just a theory. I don't know. I'm, I'm, I don't, I've never read anything conclusive about this, but I do believe that he probably burned some bridges somewhere along the line because he suddenly had a whole new trilogy to make. And I was told that he did go uh, reach out to people like Kasdan. And I mean, once he had a script written and everything, I, I, I even think, I was told he even reached out to uh, Carrie Fisher because she's written things before and she knows a hell of a lot, or she knew, sorry, a hell of a lot about Star Wars. She knows, like, at conventions and stuff, she used to challenge people to ask her any Star Wars based questions that she could to see if they could stump her. Like, she knows the universe really, really well and she's, a, you know, written things and stuff. Like, I think a lot of, he went to a lot of people and asked them for help. And for some reason, people, were not willing to help him on them. And so I don't know what the deal is, but um, if you look at, I mean, it's still his stories. It still has 
John Williams music and everything. And the music is great. I think it's missing. If you look at the, uh, the original star Wars movies, you know, they um, they say that that first one, you know, it's like a, it's like a magical, like you said, the magic sauce, you know, it's, it's a, it's a miracle that's turned out as good as it did. You know, everyone talks about the five or six elements that if any one of them had not been present, the movie would have fallen apart. You know, the music is of course, one of them. Another one that probably doesn't get talked about enough is the editing. I think it's his wife at the time was the editor. I'm pretty sure you can look it up. There's like all these, I mean, if you've read the novel or anything like that, there's, uh, or the, the radio play, whatever you want to call it of star Wars, there's scenes, you know, with him talking to bigs and, on Tatooine and stuff like that. There's story that takes place before what we see on screen, but there was no better way to start that movie than the two ships flying overhead, you know, in that big opening crazy scene and everything it just puts you right in the the world you know and um you know that's all in the editing there's so many decisions that were made that that probably saved that movie in a big way and then of course the moment that that he lucked out so perfectly with that first one suddenly by empire and jedi he had people like kasdan that he could go to for for all for writing the screenplay and things like that and that made uh if you look at the story of star wars the re one of the reasons I love Empire and Jedi so much um, and in a way more than than A New Hope is that it's at that point where the universe really got bigger. You know, I mean, Star Wars is an amazing movie, but we all only really see Tatooine, the Death Star, and a little bit of Yavin 4, and then some stuff in space. That's all we really see. It's a very, for being an incredible movie, in an incredible universe, it's a very small movie, a small scope of a movie. It Once you get to Empire and Jedi, the whole world really blows up in a big way. You get to really see a lot more of what's going on, and uh, it just grows and grows. You see more aliens and more species and more planets and all sorts of stuff, and it, it's great. Um, those movies really benefited, I think, from somebody else taking his ideas, like, like what Matt was saying earlier, and writing the stories for him. So I think if you could take the prequels and maybe have someone better, uh, you know, edit them um, and have um, some more input to help him out, you know, help, help Lucas out a little bit and maybe have somebody like Kazden or something like that, writing it, rewriting and writing the, the dialogue and the script and everything for him. I think they would have been a little better. Um, and I think it would have uh, turned out a little better than it did. That That's what I think is missing from those. And then in the sequels, um, gosh, it's hard to know where to start. I mean, like like Matt said, they, they got some stuff right, the look and the feel of the practical effects and the film, and it feels a little bit more like Star Wars for the first 15, 20 minutes of the movie, and then they introduce like a, the ultimate of all Mary Sue characters, and then, uh, I mean, I don't know. I think the... You know what? Here, uh, never mind. I know I've been talking a long time, but I'll I'll sum this up. Daisy Ridley came out after a little while, uh, after time had passed, and finally said um, on the record that basically, when they started filming The Force Awakens, she was told quietly that she was going to be Obi Wan's granddaughter, or some some relation to Obi Wan Kenobi. She was a Kenobi, is what she was originally going to be. Then. When they started filming the second one, they said they had scrapped that and she was probably going to be a Skywalker. Like some some uh, daughter of Luke or something like that, or more most likely. Then by the time they had done the third one, they had gotten such a negative response from the second one that J. A. J. Abrams came in, totally changed the story a third time. And by then they told her that she's going to be a, a, a Palpatine you know, descendant basically. And she's like, you know, the poor girl, like trying to, trying to do it, act all this out. And it's changing constantly. Yeah. The directors are at fault, but it, in this day and age, when Disney is helming one of the most successful, you know, 20 film franchise, 20 plus installment franchises in history, uh, there is no excuse whatsoever to have a Star Wars trilogy and for you to not have it entirely planned out before you start filming the first movie. That doesn't make any sense. So if the buck has to stop with somebody, I guess probably Kathleen Kennedy 
is where, probably where the, the fault lies. That's what, what was wrong with the the sequel trilogy is they had no idea what they were doing. They were just like shooting from the hip. And it was really stupid to do that. Yeah, they're very uh, reacting to the reactions. Like they're just, uh, there's so much speculation. Of what could she be? Uh, there's a limited amount of things. And they just kept trying to think of like, what would be the least likely like to bring it out of left field? And and I guess that's what they settled on. But but you're right. They should have thought of it from the beginning and worked towards that and and um, communicate that to her, or not. You know, I mean, you know, Lucas didn't you know tell you know Mark Hamill on the first movie that yeah that Darth Vader is his father. Not that it mattered. They barely have any scenes together. But um, yeah, but I, um, the the you could talk for even in uh, the Empire Strikes Back, he doesn't tell him till the actual scene is shot. Yeah, I know. No, I mean, uh, I meant to say if we we could talk for hours about all about how for being the greatest trilogy ever made uh, at every step of the way for the first movie, for sure. And then then Empire and then Jedi, like there is so many things that could have gone wrong with Star Wars. It's it's a it's a miraculous thing that it turned out as amazing as it did. Because, yeah, um, the whole chemistry with but, like uh, Le- Le- Leia and uh, yeah, and, uh, and there's Luke so many, stuff. so many things. I mean, or at least the fact that he's attracted to her, not not chemistry per se, but just yeah. Like, well, I mean, to... and and like I don't know, you guys probably knew this already, but um, it's, it's not at all a, a unknown story. But um, when they started filming Empire, or before they started filming Empire, uh, Mark Hamill got into like a motorcycle accident. Or something like that. It had big scars on his face. And George Lucas and some of the producers were worried. They were like, this guy is like, this kid is reckless. Like, he's gotten a taste of fame now. And he's probably going to kill himself. This is going to be one of those Hollywood stories where he kills himself before we can make another movie. So they were like, all right, for starters, let's make this scene in the beginning. They added the scene with the wampa that attacks him, the, which is, for everyone who doesn't know, is the, big, the snow monster, the Yeti thing. They added that in there so that they would have excuses why he has these big scratches on his face because the thing mauls him in the face. And then for the rest of the movie, they're worried that he might not even survive to film the third film. So they were like, that's why they added a lot of the stuff in there with between Obi-Wan and Yoda. It's like one of the most interesting scenes, really, where they're talking and he starts talking about, oh, there's another one, you know, and they decide to make Leia the sister and stuff just because you know, yeah, you could speculate that they could have been having a number of conversations. Some people think that they're talking about Anakin and stuff like that. But the point is that they they did the whole Leia, Luke, sister, brother and sister thing, I think, because they wanted to give themselves an out just in case Mark Hamill died or something like that. Or they, for whatever reason, they wanted to write him out of the story. They could have Leia come back as the hero in the third film, just in case, you know. And it's like you you see how they were they also were shooting from the hip and and just kind of doing whatever they could. It's miraculous it turned out as good as it did, but that is in no way, shape, or form an excuse for them doing it in uh, in 2015. Just for the record, I shoot from the hip way more accurately than either Kathleen Kennedy or Alec Baldwin. Oh God! <laughs> yeah, no, I, I think I think the whole thing about the the secret sauce. There is something about whether it's the alignment of the characters that he really like brought it from like a mythical perspective sure. in the original one that's lacking in the in the prequel and sequel trilogies. But but yeah, there's a sense of adventure that lacked a bit in the phantom menace i think was slightly corrected in attack of the clones but it was still messy the big thing with attack of the clones that you see what's the problem and i think lord of the rings does it well also braveheart and some other movies is in the original trilogies there's strategy there's a story behind what's going on. There's the, the Death Star. We need to like shoot yeah. down this thing and we're going to have a cover. There's a whole story to the battles where like in, in Attack of the Clones and Phantom Menace too, it's just like a mess. And then Anakin and the Phantom Menace like accidentally does all the right things on the ship to like save the day there. And, yeah. and the Ugh. that's just like, that's just like comedy of errors. That's just ridiculous. So it really felt like that was lost. Like movies like 
Independence Day, Lord of the Rings, really got that from Star yeah. Wars and understood that an action scene needs to have structure. It needs to have a story within it and, and a strategy. And, and, and that's satisfying for an audience. It's not just a bunch of flashing lights on the screen. It, yeah. it takes you on a journey through an action scene. Um, so I think a combination of the sense of adventure, just really rock solid characters, even if the acting itself wasn't rock solid, it kind of worked that Mark, Mark Hamill wasn't a good actor because he was supposed to be the new guy on the block, like the less confident, young kid coming in brash kid so it, yeah, his, it, it, his, his dynamic is great with the other two characters yeah if it wasn't for that his acting would have really made the movie suffer but for some reason it didn't not as much as um who's his face uh, uh hayden, hayden hayden and yeah i felt like hayden unfortunately didn't need by the second movie he need to be a a fully realized character and he just wasn't he, he was just a like a whiny little bitch, I felt like in a way he wasn't as complex as he should have been. Not even close. So yeah, I think it's a combination of all those things that's just really tough to get together again. And then the sequels, I, I agree with Matt. Like JJ just lacks a soul. Like I, I'm actually not sure if he's a human being. <laughs> <laughs> like he might be a robot. I, I'm not sure. He's a bad robot. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But but oh, I, really, I get it. <laughs> I really feel like he tries very hard, like to make it look good, to have a sense of adventure. Yeah. But I don't know That's why it's. Effort. But it's so hollow, and I can't it's explain so it what it is about J.J. Abrams because he's he's a panderer. He panders to the audience as opposed to taking them on a journey that they don't expect. That that's I think what's lacking in his movies, and and unfortunately is not. Um, he does not avoid that in Force Awakens and Rise of Skywalker, in spite of the fact that I, I can enjoy aspects of those movies. But it's it's too bad that he just just that one extra step. I, I do think that he suits the Star Wars universe better than Star Trek, most definitely. Probably. But it was still not not as good or not at least as as remotely daring as what Ryan Johnson was trying to do. And and I'll, I'll agree, The Last Jedi is not remotely close to the originals. I, I think Rogue One is a better movie than The Last Jedi. But 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 yeah, like Matt said, at least he was trying something. And, uh, and that's the least that you can do. I know you can't take very, very big risks with like big franchises, but you know, you could bring something to it, like have some twist on it. It's very tough to put your finger on it, and and maybe it'll never be matched. Because I, I do think as good as Rogue One is, it's not the original trilogy. It was trying to do something completely oh, different. No, no, no. Not as good as that. It, it's kind of feels like Rogue One is very similar to what they're doing with the Mandalorian, and I didn't see the other shows, but but you know, just saying like, okay, this is there's this universe. Let's put the lightsabers aside. And what else can we tell? What other stories can we tell in this universe? And we can, you know, bring in the lightsabers from time to time, but really, like, not don't don't get stuck too much on on this is the only thing that it is. And and I think that approach worked well because we've gotten enough lightsabers in the actual saga that uh, that exploring beyond that is probably the right way to go. And maybe in five, ten, fifteen years, it'll be the right time to bring another you know, trilogy of lightsabers with the right story. But 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 it feels like that it just needs some time to breathe after the prequels and the sequels. I don't know. To well, me. It, it helps that um, Felicity Jones is like a great actress, too. Yeah, I mean, a lot of them are good actors in the sequels. Uh, there, there's just a chemistry. Like, it's... Uh, Oscar Isaac is good, but I feel like he's meh in it. Oh, um, in it. Mean, yeah. Yeah, and um, uh, what's her name? Ray, I uh, forgot her name. Daisy Ridley. Uh, Daisy Ridley. She's yeah. adequate. Uh, Adam Driver is adequate. Uh, Adam Driver's uh, great, yeah. Yeah, he's good. But but yeah. but in that movie, for some reason, they don't resonate as much as they might in other, like, Agreed. you know. I mean, it's just that J.J. Abrams doesn't know how to think. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but, there's a, there's a lot that we could go into when it comes to that. <laughs> yeah, I I mean I've always been a bigger Star Trek fan than I am a Star Wars fan. 
Sure. I love Star Wars. I, 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 I've been watching the, the original trilogy on VHS since I was like, you know, four years old. I, yeah. I have it all memorized. I've just been a bigger Star Trek fan growing up. And J.J. Abrams doesn't give a flying fuck about actually understanding the the property Universe. he's taking over. Yeah. Just, and, and by the way, like Alex Fux, fucking Kurtzman, who's been a writer on all these things, uh, apparently one of the main characters in Strange New Worlds is like a, a descendant of Khan. Oh, God. Uh, before Kirk even takes over and Spock is there and somehow Spock doesn't bring it up in Space Seed, hey, you know that chick who's on the helm, uh, who was on the helm for years, uh, uh, she's like his great-granddaughter. I mean, like, what the fuck are these people thinking about? And J.J. Abrams doesn't care. J.J. Abrams just wants to create mystery boners. And member berries. Right. Yeah. Uh, I, I, no, I, it does feel like that to him. It's like a box. It's like a box that he um, that he kind of creates and he wants to play with to like make it a puzzle. But they're not nearly as interesting a puzzle as what say like someone like Nolan does. Like, because Nolan not only makes these mystery boxes that you can explore and lose yourself in and get captivated, he also adds really good characterization really good dialogue really good ideas in most of his yeah. movies and, and it basically Just like better movies jj abrams is a poor man's christopher nolan like really a, like really, a very very poor man maybe like a street <laughs> urchins <laughs> yeah yeah no no it's it's it is funny because they are not they're not dissimilar like there's something about them they're there to please the audience they really know what the audience likes but they're like, but I'm still going to give you a meal. Like, I'm not just going to give you chocolates and, and, and jelly beans and, and, you know, like gummy bears. Like, I, I need to give you some soup. <laughs> there needs to be some meat in there. Like, you know, that's what <laughs> Nolan does. Like, but, but J.J. Abrams was like, no, nah, you don't need your teeth. Just, 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 just eat, eat it up. Just eat it all up. Just eat it. And then you'll puke it. You know, at the end, because you'll realize that, like, all you got was the sugary stuff and, and nothing of substance. And I think that's really sums up what he does in his movies. That is very accurate. But like Matt said, too, a lack of of care when it comes to the story. Like, even if you didn't have any substance and you just made it, like, light and, and with you know, and, and fun and without substance. But you got to have a, a, a story that makes sense. Like um, the Force Awakens, that Maz Kanata character has Anakin's lightsaber. We don't know how. We don't know why she got it. How she got it. She seems to know Han and Chewie really well, like like really really well. So presumably she knows that their connection to Luke and Leia. She talks about Luke with a first on a first name basis. Uh, so. If she's had this lightsaber for so long and she knows the significance of it, why, number one, how'd she get it? Number two, why did she not give it to them at some point in time so that it would get to Luke? On top of that, when Ray touches it, she has this big, like, incredible feeling, like force-powered feeling from it, like as if she is somehow connected to that lightsaber. I mean, unless she's actually a Skywalker and a descendant of Anakin, why would that even, there's no reason why that would have any reaction to her whatsoever. Yeah. So it, it doesn't make any damn sense, but like, that's even just like tip of the iceberg. You know, when I, when that movie started, I thought one of the, one of the coolest things that I was so excited about was, um, uh, what's his name? His character, Finn. You know, I thought that was a unique idea to have the the, the reformed stormtrooper play a big part. You know, well, of course, his character barely did anything once once that first movie's over. I honestly think this is one of the things that drives me crazy that 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 people don't actually even talk about this. But I really do think that he had two completely different stories when they made that movie, and they didn't know which one to pick. 
and they just kind of crammed them together and hoped that nobody noticed. Because he's supposed to be FN2187. He's supposed to be this, this elite stormtrooper that was like part of that shock troop that works with Phasma and Kylo Ren. You know, they you see in that scene where Hux is like addressing all the, the all of the troops before they fire the big star killer base thing. There's like thousands and thousands of people in the first order. You know, it's not like a little tiny fly by night organization. It's huge. But he is so well trained and he's su- such an important guy that he's part of the actual group that they fight with because both Phasma and Kylo Ren know him by his face. Like he doesn't even have another name, but they know who he is just by the look of him. So he clearly spends a great deal of time enough that they would know who he is, you know? And then when, when his comrade dies, he shows real emotion. Like, Oh my gosh, this guy was close to him. So clearly these people are chosen from birth, they say, and trained from birth. And yet they're they're like, he's got to be the most elite of all the stormtroopers that they have really to be that close to these characters. And then, uh, which I think is very interesting. You know, I think if you tell the story of that character trying to have a change of heart and escape, that's an interesting character and they should have gone with that. But then later in the story, they're, they're talking about infiltrating, you know, the base or something like that. And uh, he tells Han Solo, uh, Finn tells him that uh, he lied and that his actual duties are that he's a glorified garbage man. Yeah. Like he, he says like, oh, I know how to get us into that one area. And they're like, oh, really? Well, okay. And then they get there and he's like, I don't know how to do this. I'm just here to save Ray. And he's like, what the hell is wrong with you? Like Han Solo tells him like, do you know how many people are risking their lives for this? You can't be doing that stuff. And it's like, that doesn't make any sense. No, he's not a glorified garbage man. He's a he's an elite stormtrooper. And, and then I've heard people say like, well, he could be both. No, he can't be both. Like they even have scenes where he knows about the garbage system. So they clearly were trying to say that he was a glorified garbage receptacle person. You know, that's so stupid. It doesn't make any sense. Stormtroopers are raised from birth. They have, they put them through the most like intense training. Some of them die in the process of becoming stormtroopers. You don't have the most elite stormtroopers you have doing garbage duty. There's a whole bunch of people in the empire and the first order that aren't troopers. They're not, combat people they change the tra- they change the the you know the bed sheets and and do the you know the, the the trash duty and stuff like that that's that's something that somebody else does you don't have somebody doing both of those things that doesn't make any sense it's like clearly they they had thought of this funny story where they could have a, a tie back to a new hope with the trash compactor idea and they were like this is good we're gonna put this in the movie and then nobody thought to go that doesn't actually make sense he can't be both of those two things. Yeah. One thing I um, I was going to ask before we wrap up, um, did, it, did it bother you that, uh, I don't know why it really bothered me that at the end of the prequel trilogy, that they reveal Luke and Leia <laughs> to be the, the two, the twins that are, that are like given birth to. Uh, I'm like, why do that? Like, basically, you've ruined the, the prequels. Like, you cannot show these movies in, in the story order. You'll forever have to watch the first three, then go back to the prequels, and, and, you know, and then move on from there. Like, you can't really, you know, if, if you remove that one scene there, or at least the naming of the children, then it plausibly you could watch it in the correct order. Um, I, I, it's interesting you bring it up. I, I personally, I see exactly where you're coming from. I do think it's a bit of an issue, but it is nowhere near the the problem I have with the ending of that movie. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, it's, it, it goes along with it. Yeah. I mean, the problem with that movie is that they, they took 10 years off the story. Mm -hmm. The Jedi purge and the fall of Anakin and all that stuff and Darth Vader becoming a thing and all that stuff like that, that is supposed to take place like 30 years before approximately 30 years before a new hope. And they, 
they, they tied they tried to tie all the movies up together with a nice, nice little bow at the very end and they crammed way too much stuff at the end of that movie and that's one of the reasons why it suffers a bit uh is because of that and then they have to just come up with some stupid reason why La uh, padme dies and it, it's like it's really dumb but um yeah i mean i guess that that's a way to do it is to just not it, you know to if you wanted to try and make it a proper saga where you're not giving anything away yeah you could you could be a lot more ambiguous with the ending that would have been better i guess yeah uh, one other thing i was going to say about the prequels because you touched on the fact that like you know lucas should have gotten some help is you know it's funny because they're giving um what's his name taika watiti uh yeah. they're giving him to do a star wars movie and um and you know and he's like a borderline like a quirky comedy director you know but borderline. But, he's, but he's but he's <laughs> like <blown>. very <laughs> successful at doing various genres including action yeah. and stuff yeah but yeah because because there were stories i think there's several like uh you know like steven soderbergh uh i think if i'm not mistaken like send a like mail to lucas and wanted to be involved with the prequels and lucas kind of snuffed at that and spike jones to um reach out to him and and even though they're like smaller quirky directors back then i wonder if that would have given some interesting more youngish energy to the to the prequels that that might have lacked and george lucas like an aging filmmaker um but uh say. but i guess we'll never know because we'll see what um taiki watiti does with the yeah uh, <laughs> it's uh it's definitely a, an interesting um story of this whole saga any other uh, aspects of it that we haven't covered i think matt definitely Nothing gave jj I, I a beating yeah, <laughs> I, I, the, we, I could talk for another two hours about what's wrong with the, the prequels or the sequels but I, I don't think that that's a worthy use for our time yeah no i think more than anything uh, the way i would sum it up is, is more than anything that unlike jason i i don't watch these movies very often that I should revisit it. I, I didn't revisit them for this episode specifically because I felt like it should be an overall impressions that we've yeah, had that makes over sense. the years. But yeah, I would be curious if I ever get around. Most likely what's going to happen is I'll just in a few years, I'll watch all of them with my kids when they come of age. <laughs> but, uh, you know, to maybe have a discussion about it then to see like where we're at, like rewatching it a few years from now, because it's it is um, it's definitely perplexing the way it's just uh, they ha haven't been able to duplicate that magic. I feel like we've gotten close to it with other trilogies, like the yeah. Lord of the Ring trilogy. Yeah. There's been movies that came close. Like you know, I mentioned Independence Day to me I when I was sure. growing up. To me, that was a movie that felt the closest thing to Star Wars as far as like epicness and all, and all yeah. that. So there's movies that came close, but to, but to make a Star Wars movie... Like to have it be a Star Wars movie, it's. I guess we'll see if that happens in, in our lifetime, but it's uh, <laughs> it's gonna be tough to get up there. Uh, earlier, I was kind of talking about the the different kinds of Star Wars fans, you know. Yeah, and I I think it's funny because um, funny, interesting, not funny, haha. -ha, but uh, there's there's a thing, especially when you're talking to. Uh, people online there's kind of a lot of animosity that doesn't need to be there you know but i i find it very interesting when you're talking to older star wars fans you know the ones who got to live through it you know they got to be there when everything changed you know they got to see star wars in theaters and, and change their life and then they got to see the sequels and so on and so forth and then you you talk to the younger ones the um the ones who've you know grown up in the last 20 five years or something <laughs> it's funny because the two scenes that i think about that describe my feelings the most are from two they're from different movies you know when i talk to um the older fans i think i feel like tom hardy in um uh his bane character in the the dark knight rises because uh he's got that scene where he's talking to batman and he says uh he says something about like uh he says, like, oh, you you embraced the darkness, but I was born into it, yeah. you know, kind of thing. <laughs> and I feel like that's how it is, because it's like they, they there's a lot of like older fans out there who are like, oh, well, I was there when this all started. 
you know, like I, I, I've lived through every moment of Star Wars, you know, kind of thing. And to me, I'm always like, well, that's true. And I'll give you that because I, I'll never be able to experience what that was like. Never, you know, but you, you were, I, I feel like telling them like you, you were somebody who loved movies maybe or something like that. And this, this movie affected you and changed your life in a really dramatic way. Uh, but, you know, I, I, I was, I was born when Return of the Jedi was still in theaters. I never knew a world where there wasn't a Star Wars, you know, before I ever actually sat down and had the attention span to watch one of the movies from beginning to end. I already knew who some of the characters were just because Star Wars was already such a big thing, you know, like there was books and like, like, like coloring books and, and pictures and things all, it, it was very much a part of the world already, you know? And, yeah. and I, that's why I feel like that, that uh, that Bane scene is really appropriate for that, but um, but then the other way is even kind of inter more interesting because you got these younger kids that uh, you know the, the people that are like twenty five and younger kind of thing, and it's like we're living in a whole new world now. Like nerd culture is so mainstream, and when I was a kid, I would have killed to be able to buy a Star Wars T shirt. Yeah. You know, that, that shit didn't exist. I remember going to Disneyland for the first time. and Well, not the first time, but um, the first time I was old enough to start going on a bunch of rides and stuff. I remember the first time I ever went on Star Tours. And it, like, it, it blew my goddamn mind, you know? And, like, I, I got out of that 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 uh, ride, and they put you right into that, that gift shop, you know, where there's all sorts of Star Wars stuff there. Like that was the only that was the first place in my entire life I saw a t-shirt with Star Wars stuff on it. You know, like I know they had t-shirts back in the 80s and stuff when the movies were coming out, but growing up in the 90s, there was no Star Wars stuff, not until 97 or 98 yeah. when uh when they announced that the uh the special edition was coming out, then you saw a new influx of of star wars memorabilia all over the merchandising place. merchandise there you go exactly <laughs> but uh yeah when i was a kid i had i bought a boba fett t-shirt from the the gift shop at uh, in tomorrowland and i wore that thing so often that you can see it in my uh my school pictures uh in in two years in a row in grade school probably like fifth and sixth grade or something like that like i mean i wore that thing until it was ratty and disgusting because like you just couldn't even get t-shirts back then you couldn't get there were some toys obviously there was lots of stuff like you said merchandising <laughs> but um now i mean you can go to any target in the world and find five or six star wars t-shirts you can go to regular stores and find stuff there's there's websites that specialize in making fantastically awesome fun hilarious star wars themed things you know costumes that look almost realistic to the movie and stuff like that you could purchase i mean we're just we're living in a whole new age and more importantly than any of that forget about the, the stuff it's the the culture you know yeah like when i was i i think my, my buddy said it really well i'm trying to remember what how he put it but when i was growing up if you were i mean star wars was a very very popular trilogy it was a very popular uh movie but if you were a huge Star Wars fan, that didn't make you popular. <laughs> if anything, that was a strike against you, socially speaking. You know? <laughs> um, I, I was definitely not in the in crowd or anything for running around signing people's yearbooks saying, may the force be with you, you know, and stuff like that. You know, it, did, it, it was not like that at all until things started making a big difference, of course, when the prequels came out. That was a huge turning point, of course. All I'm saying is that uh, it was a, my, I was trying to keep that short, but that was my super long-winded way of saying that like, when I talk to these younger kids now, I think about the, the scene in Rogue One where um, they've, they've just gone to that, um, uh, the, the, the hidden secret facility where, um, uh, where her father is being kept, uh, Mad Milkinson is being <laughs> kept uh, there. And, um, and a Cassian character goes to assassinate him because he's been given orders to kill him. And he decides not to, but then she, uh, she climbs up the ladder. She has a last moment with her dad and then they all get back on the ship. And now both of her parents have been killed by the empire. 
and she's got this new she's been wishy-washy the whole movie and then in the scene she's a big turning point for her because it's right before the climax of the movie and she has this newly re re renewed vigor and and hatred for the empire and she really lets casting have it because everyone has determined that he went up there to kill her father and he did they all know he didn't do it but he still did that he walked he went up there to kill the guy and so she really just like lays into him about it and he bites back and he says like uh he says something really really great to her he says something like like oh so suddenly this means a lot to you like oh this is a big deal to you now all of a sudden well congratulations I i've been living this my whole life yeah <laughs> like fan, fan cred yeah, um, and, and I mean, I, I that that's that can come off as really, really egotistical, and I don't want it to, you know. But uh, but there, there's a there's a thing where it's like, I, don't get me wrong, I love it. I love the time I'm living in right now because there's no better time to be a nerd than right now. I guess I'm just saying that they got it really easy. <laughs> you know? One thing uh, I was thinking as you were saying that that I, I didn't say in my rant earlier in my appreciation of Star Wars yeah. and why it's uniquely one of the greatest stories ever told on the movie screen is that it's it's also the fact that it's not that violent like it's it's almost like a kid story but it's not it's not actual swords even though there's some limbs being cut like it's very minimal mm -hmm. um, like but the fact that like you you dull the 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 blade by not having an actual knife and it's a lightsaber and the fact that instead of bullets and blood you have um blasters the blasters all that is just so smart like it makes it so less violent in a way more video game like that because i'm thinking about it because my kids watch a lot of short lego star wars videos yeah and one of the irony there is that I they pretty much know all the characters because you're talking about knowing the characters before the right. movies came out. Yeah. Like they pretty much know all the plot points. They've already heard the I'm your father line and everything. And I have this hope that as long as they don't get watched those too many times that maybe in two, three, four years, they'll forget it. And then when they watch the actual movies, they'll still have the appreciation for those moments. Like maybe they won't know them, but then again, I, I, I don't know. Maybe they, they will know all the plot points, but it'll just be in a new light. Cause it'll be live action. Just make but, sure you show it to them in the right order. Yeah, no. And it definitely makes sense to just watch the original trilogy and appreciate that with all the back, you know, the backstory before you get into it with the prequels. I, I think it definitely makes sense. Uh, but yeah, there's something about those movies, especially the original ones, that's so harmless, yet it's got violence, not harsh violence, it's got adventure, it's got everything, but it's it's really, really harmless. It's not The Lord of the Rings, it's not Braveheart, you know, like, it, it's not, yeah. like, it really just skirts this very fine line of, like, it's exciting, it's fun, but it's harmless. Like, it, it's not, it's not very, very bloody, but it's effective. And uh, it's just, it's not there's, for everybody. just yeah, there's very, very few stories, like very, very few movies that really skirt that line that uh, unless they very are, like are very teethless, like, you know, I mean, some superhero movies can can lack any teeth. Uh, but um, but yeah, no, it's it's something very, very unique to Star Wars. He just a stroke of genius. He just came up with this universe and these weapons and this combination of things that is just it was just meant to be. Yeah. <laughs> it's just, I don't know. It, it's so amazing too. Like you said, it's it's just enough of I just enough ideas from you know from uh, from Flash Gordon and uh, Valerium and sci-fi type stuff like that, and so much influence from like the samurai stuff and Kurosawa in terms of the structure of the first movie is of course. And all those ideas from Campbell and, and stuff like that, you know, it's like, it's, it's just, uh, it's so perfect. It's got all, a little bit of everything, you know, and it just somehow works so perfectly. Of course, a lot of stuff from Dune. Yeah. And, and I know Matt said that Star Trek, uh, yeah, the messianic story and everything. And I know Matt said that Star Trek is still his favorite franchise. And it's, for me, it's tough to compare between them. It's kind of like picking your favorite child in a way. I, I feel like they're just different. They serve two very different purposes. 
obviously the Star Wars movies are much more significant to me than the Star Trek movies but but there's no nothing we'll see in 20 years how many shows they make about star wars but i can only imagine that none of them will top you know the original star trek series and especially not tng and deep space nine so so i, I really think star trek just rules as far as like the best tv franchise of all time and star wars just is the best movie franchise of all time basically they serve like different purposes but the first mm. link, the chain is forged. The first thought forbidden. The first. Uh, 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 fuck. Uh, uh. <laughs> okay. okay, with the first link, the chain is forged. The first thought forbidden, the first freedom denied, chains us all irrevocably. Yeah. Uh, Judge Aaron Sati quoted by Picard in the episode The Drumhead. I was also thinking, um, oh, you think darkness is your ally, but you were merely adopted by the dark. I was raised in it, molded by it. <laughs> That's what I was referring to earlier. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, the Bane thing, but yeah, I, I also totally fucked up the, uh, the the Picard line, I I, <laughs> I, I, I I I I had that in my brain until I tried to actually put it out into words, <laughs> and, uh, and, I, and I entirely screwed it up. But I, I, I not entirely. I, I mean, it's you know, I I got the gist of it. But you know, yeah, yeah. Uh, but no, it, I mean. <clears throat> Yeah, Star Trek used to have some good ideas, and then J.J. Abrams took over and decided that Scotty didn't... It didn't occur to Scotty to think of space as a thing that was moving. Yeah, I, I don't know why he's got such a problem with, like, I mean, he, he definitely showed that he doesn't know or care anything about the concept of warp drives in in his uh in his star trek movies and then he he and uh well i'm not going to include ryan johnson in this although there's it's, it's a separate issue I, should, I would say but both of them seem to have real serious problems understanding how hyperdrives work in star wars so it's it's a serious problem a man with such thick glasses should actually be able to understand the basics of a work drive. <laughs> yeah. You would think I mean, you would be a nerd. <laughs> his glasses are thicker than are thicker than mine are. And <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. uh, I I I I just don't I I I, I could forgive all of that. I could forgive all of those minor, like nitpicky, nerdy details if there were just a few moments where it's just like, okay, yeah, Kirk doesn't just get to be a cadet who immediately becomes the captain of the flagship of the Federation overnight. It's a really bad idea for the story. 